Joachim Piper, an emblematic SS officer, remains one of history's most controversial figures. From his rise in Nazi Germany to his obscure death in France, Piper's story is defined by both mystery and moral complexity. Join us as we go through Piper's life and unravel the truth behind the myths surrounding this polarizing figure. Early Life and Family the story of Joachim Piper begins on January 30, 1915, when he was born in the heart of Berlin, a city then pulsating with the complex interplay of political and social currents that would soon engulf all of Europe. He entered life in a bourgeois family from Silesia, at a time when Germany was plunged into turmoil and humiliation following its defeat in World War I and the vindictive Treaty of Versailles. Like many households, the Piper family was not immune to the prevailing nationalist sentiments swirling through German society. Piper's father, Woldemar, was an embittered veteran of Kaiser Wilhelm's Imperial Army. He fell to the false yet rising myth that Jews and communists had conspired to undermine the war effort and rob Germany of its rightful victory. This toxic environment shaped young Joachim's early worldview. Piper had two brothers, Hans and Horst, who in their own tragic ways, fell victim to the tumultuous times. Hans lingered in a vegetative state after a failed suicide attempt until finally passing in 1942 at the age of 28. Horst died under shadowy circumstances in 1926 at just 20 years old, with dark whispers that fellow SS men had driven him to take his own life due to alleged through his adolescence, Piper witnessed Germany transformed by the defeat of World War I, the economic chaos of hyperinflation, and the rise of political extremism on both left and right. The reactionary nationalism which gripped his family would soon find dreadful manifestation in the Nazi party's meteoric rise to power. For Piper, the Nazi seizure of power in January 1933, when he was 18 years old, marked a pivotal juncture. In the Nazis, his family's nostalgia for Germany's imperial past found new expressions fused with modern techniques of propaganda, coercion, and terror. Too young to have directly experienced the First World War, Piper belonged to the generation ripe for indoctrination by Hitler's radical vision of conquest and racial war to restore German supremacy. Hitler Youth and SS in October 1933, just months after Hitler became Chancellor, Piper took the first major step on his journey into Nazism by joining the SS Schutzstaffel, the elite paramilitary organization under Hitler's direct control. The SS, in its sleek black uniforms, embodied the mystique and privilege of Nazi cultural dominance and political power. By enlisting, Piper made an unambiguous declaration of personal allegiance to Hitler's authority and the seductive Nazi ideology. His commitment was formalized on January 23, 1934, when he was granted SS membership number 132. He was now bound body and soul to the SS order. The following year in 1935, Piper embarked on a career as a full-time SS officer. His rapid promotion likely owed much to the patronage and guidance of Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer SS, who took a strong personal interest in Piper's cultivation as part of the new generation of SS leadership. Piper underwent intensive military and ideological training at the SS Junkerschule Officer Academy to cement his place in the upper ranks of the SS. While not naturally physically imposing, Piper compensated through confidence, intelligence, and personal magnetism. Himmler saw him as epitomizing the ethos of an educated, cultured SS warrior elite who would one day rule Hitler's projected thousand-year Reich. Piper's zeal, performance, and connections marked him for rapid advancement even at a young age. By 23, he attained the rank of Unterscharfuhrer or sergeant, a meteoric rise in the regimented SS hierarchy. Groomed by Himmler as part of the new officer corps, Piper's uncompromising National Socialist principles positioned him for an increasingly prominent role in the SS security apparatus. Having sworn unconditional loyalty to SS ideals, Piper was about to be thrust directly into the maelstrom of Hitler's campaigns of conquest, racial cleansing, and genocide as Europe descended into the most destructive conflict in human history. Witness to Atrocities Joachim Piper's privileged role as Himmler's personal adjutant provided a front-row seat to some of the worst crimes committed in the name of Nazism during those early days of Hitler's rule. This direct exposure to state-sanctioned brutality helped numb Piper's conscience and steal his resolve to follow orders without question. One chilling example came in September 1939, 
Shortly after the German invasion and occupation of Poland, Piper traveled in Himmler's private train carriage, where he witnessed the public executions of around 20 prominent Polish civic leaders, academics, and clergy. Their alleged crime was daring to organize resistance against their new German overlords. Far from being horrified by the specter of mass murder, Piper saw the killings as an effective warning to intimidate the wider Polish population into submission through terror tactics. Likewise, Piper was an intimate witness to the Nazis' ruthless expulsion of Jews and ethnic Poles from annexed Polish territories. Their homes were forcibly expropriated to create German living space, or Lebensraum, for Aryan settler colonists, part of Hitler's radical vision for ethnic cleansing and colonization of Eastern Europe. Piper observed firsthand the misery inflicted as Polish men, women, and children were deported in cramped boxcars or simply driven out on foot into the countryside, with thousands perishing from deprivation along the way. That December, Piper also observed one of the first gassings of the Nazi euthanasia program, targeting mentally ill patients deemed Lebensunwertes Leben, life unworthy of life. This murderous campaign aimed to cleanse German society by systematically eliminating those deemed defective or worthless, according to Nazi pseudo-racial ideology. At the hospital in Owinska, Piper dispassionately described patients laughing and talking unaware before succumbing to the poison gas in the sealed chamber. By witnessing such formative atrocities up close, without a hint of protest, Piper actively embraced his insider role facilitating the genocidal agenda of Hitler and Himmler. He plunged headlong into the ethical abyss as any youthful reservations faded and he developed the hardened mindset of a fanatical SS man. Piper was present at the inception of the ideological indoctrination and mass killings that foreshadowed the unprecedented genocide of the Holocaust yet to come. Concentration Camp Tours as the war progressed, Joachim Piper continued his duty as Himmler's trusted adjutant. This grim role afforded him insider access to some of the worst atrocities committed under the Nazi regime. Between 1939 and 1940, Piper accompanied Himmler on tours of various concentration camps across Germany and occupied Poland. These visits offered Piper chilling first-hand exposure to the workings of the SS camp system. One of the earliest such tours occurred in 1939, when Piper traveled with Himmler to inspect the Noengam concentration camp near Hamburg. Originally established in 1938 as a small satellite camp of Sachsenhausen, Neuengamme would later become one of the largest camps in Germany and the site of at least 42,000 deaths by 1945. During Himmler and Piper's visit, Neuengamme held just a few hundred prisoners deployed on brickworks labor. Seeing the facility in its early stages likely gave Piper insight into the future scale of operations. After Neuengamme, Piper joined Himmler on an inspection of Sachsenhausen itself, one of the first and most brutal camps built by the SS in 1936. By late 1939, Sachsenhausen held over 11,000 prisoners, with tens of thousands more passing through until 1945. Piper observed firsthand the ruthless conditions and cruel treatment that were characteristic of SS camps. In 1940, Piper continued traveling with Himmler to visit additional sites like Flossenburg and Buchenwald, Flossenburg held both political prisoners and forced laborers for the German war effort. Buchenwald was renowned for its cruel medical experimentation on inmates. At every location, Piper was witness to the countless prisoners, harsh discipline, forced labor, and frequent executions. He saw the cold inner workings of the concentration camp apparatus. Piper's tours also extended to the east after the invasion of Poland. He visited camps like Auschwitz, and saw the unfolding horrors in the Jewish ghettos of Lublin and Warsaw. In Lublin, Piper saw the operations of Globochnik, who oversaw deportations of Jews and Poles to make room for ethnic German settlers per Nazi policy. In Warsaw, Piper likely witnessed similar large-scale force displacement. At Auschwitz, he saw the mechanized killing technology in development. By traveling alongside the architect of the concentration camp system, Joachim Piper had a privileged vantage point to the SS machinery of death and exploitation. While the full horror of the Holocaust was yet to come, Piper's tours with Himmler foreshadowed the intended fate of those the SS deemed racially or politically undesirable. For Piper, the camps were places not of outrage but of interest, their prisoners not fellow humans but racial enemies of the Reich. His callous acceptance reveals how intertwined his fate had become with that of the Nazi killing machine. Invasion of France When Germany launched its successful invasion of France in May 1940, Joachim Piper found himself temporarily transferred back to a battlefield role. 
Having impressed Himmler with his capability and ideological commitment, Piper was assigned as a platoon leader in the 1st SS Panzer Division as it spearheaded the assault into France. The campaign proved short but decisive. Within just 46 days, France was forced into capitulation after the innovative German blitzkrieg tactics drove deep through the Ardennes and split Allied forces. During the fighting, Piper led his platoon with distinction, employing bold maneuvers to overrun French defenses. One notable action saw Piper capture an artillery battery, for which he was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. Just a month later in June 1940, Piper's continued strong performance earned him the prestigious Iron Cross First Class Medal. Young, ambitious, and brave in the face of fire, he epitomized the superbly trained and fanatical elite of the Waffen-SS. Beyond medals, Piper's other spoil of war was a French civilian sports car, which he shipped back to Germany for personal use. While Piper excelled militarily in France, his primary role remained Himmler's trusted adjutant. After securing victory, Piper traveled back to Germany in June 1940 to resume his administrative duties alongside the Reichsführer SS. In September, Himmler personally thanked Piper and other distinguished commanders, praising their toughness in executing Polish people and intellectuals. To Himmler, Piper embodied the young generation of SS officers conditioned to carry out killings deemed necessary to Nazi racial objectives. Piper's success in France amplified his reputation within SS ranks and strengthened his standing with senior leaders like Himmler. Having proven his battlefield audacity, Piper was destined for greater command roles in the future. But it was his unwavering ideological allegiance that set him apart as one of Himmler's favorite protégés. Piper's blood-soaked future role in the war was already taking shape. Brutality on the Eastern Front After serving in the invasion of France, Joachim Piper found himself headed east in 1941 as part of Operation Barbarossa, Nazi Germany's apocalyptic war against the Soviet Union. Piper was given several months to help prepare soldiers under his command for the coming conflict. When Barbarossa commenced in June 1941, Piper was once again in a combat leadership role with the 1st SS Panzer Division, leading his men directly into the maelstrom. From the outset, the tone was set for unrestrained brutality against civilian populations. Piper's actions faithfully embodied the racial animus underpinning the struggle between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union's multi-ethnic society. To the SS mindset, the war in the East was an existential battle against Judeo-Bolshevism that necessitated the harshest measures. One notorious incident occurred in 1943 after Piper's unit had retaken the village of Krasnaya Poliana. Inside, Piper discovered the mutilated bodies of what he claimed were German medical officers slain by partisans. In retaliation, he ordered his men to burn down the entire village and shoot all inhabitants. Hundreds were massacred in the reprisal killing. Similar atrocities stained the wake of Piper's movement across the Eastern Front. His motorized SS division came to be known as the Blowtorch Battalion for their frequent torching of civilian villages during the advance. Local populations were either shot, burned alive in buildings, or deported eastward to grim fates. By conservative estimates, Piper's unit was responsible for thousands of non-combatant deaths. For Joachim Piper and the SS, such war crimes were not excesses, but purposeful policies to secure victory by breaking the enemy's will to resist. Piper pursued this brutal doctrine with ruthless zeal, commanding his men to carry out collective punishments that claimed the lives of countless innocents. The Eastern Front showcased the marriage of Piper's military prowess with his fanatical National Socialist ideology, a toxic combination that transformed him into a monster in human form. The Boves Massacre In 1943, Joachim Piper and his 1st SS Panzer Division were redeployed from the Eastern Front to Italy, following the overthrow of Mussolini and Italy's surrender. Nazi Germany quickly moved to occupy northern and central Italy to prevent an Allied foothold. Piper's arrival exacerbated the already brutal German occupation. One notorious incident occurred on September 1943 in the village of Boves. On September 19th, Italian resistance fighters ambushed a column of SS soldiers near Boves, killing one and capturing two others. In response, Piper and his men encircled the village and threatened to destroy it and massacre all inhabitants unless the prisoners were released. The local priest and a businessman negotiated with Piper, securing both the hostages and the dead soldiers' remains as demanded. However, Piper violated the agreement after the fact and ordered the executions of civilians in a reprisal attack. The two negotiators were doused in petrol and burned alive. 
In total, Piper's men murdered 24 civilians in cold blood, including the elderly, women, and a disabled veteran. They looted and destroyed homes, killing a deaf-mute man and shooting a priest administering last rites. Hundreds of houses were torched as well. Despite the negotiated settlement, Piper willfully targeted civilians for horrific killings and destruction as collective punishment. His actions exemplified the brutality of the German occupation and forged his notoriety as a merciless SS commander. While Piper claimed his motives were to retaliate for the initial ambush, the wanton slaying of innocent townspeople, women, and clergy revealed Piper's true motivation as intimidation through indiscriminate violence. The Boves massacre stained both Piper's record and the image of the Waffen SS in Italy. As word spread, it fueled further anti-German resistance and outraged Allied forces. Back in Germany, Himmler decorated Piper with the Knight's Cross, the highest military honor of the Third Reich after personally thanking him for exterminating the Italians. But with his ferocious cruelty, Piper did as much to undermine the Nazi occupation as he did to sustain it. The massacre was a signature act, linking Piper's name to the killing of defenseless civilians, Normandy, and breakdown. By June 1944, Joachim Piper and the elite 1st SS Panzer Division had been withdrawn from the Eastern Front and deployed to France to counter the anticipated Allied invasion. However, Piper would play little role in the initial defense as the Allies launched Operation Overlord and began landing on the beaches of Normandy on June 6. Instead, Piper was kept in reserve and tasked with training SS replacements to reinforce decimated panzer units battling the Allied beachhead. The training regimen was notoriously harsh, with Piper implementing a draconian disciplinary code to forge the green troops into fanatical fighters willing to die for the fatherland. By various accounts, Piper had between 5 to 50 recruits summarily shot as examples during training, viewing such ruthless measures as necessary to build obedience. However, as the Normandy campaign wore on through June and July, the 1st SS Panzer Division was gradually bled white by the Allied onslaught, losing 25% of its 20,000 men and all of its tank complement. The deterioration took a toll on Piper, as the professional soldier helplessly watched years of skillful leadership become unraveled. The immense Allied material advantage dashed any hopes of driving the invaders back into the sea. The personal and professional stresses of the situation affected Piper severely. By August, the once arrogant and aggressive commander suffered a total nervous breakdown. He was evacuated from frontline service on August 2nd and sent to a military hospital for treatment of his mental collapse. The man who oversaw horrendous war crimes was himself not immune to trauma in the cauldron of war. Piper would remain in recovery for several months as catastrophic defeats mounted for Nazi Germany both in Normandy and on the Eastern Front. When he eventually returned to duty, the war had irrevocably turned against Germany, with Allied forces now crashing through the West Wall defenses and threatening the Reich itself. Despite his earlier fanaticism, Piper was now just one of many SS officers, desperately trying to salvage something from the impending defeat. His finest hour had come and gone, Malmedy Massacre. The most infamous act associated with Joachim Piper unfolded during the Battle of the Bulge, Hitler's desperate final thrust in the West in December 1944. By this stage of the war, and was charged with commanding an SS battle group spearheading the Ardennes offensive, his Kampfgruppe, the combat groups of the working class, was the best equipped, including the new 70-ton King Tiger heavy tanks. On December 17th, Piper's column was nearing the village of Malmedy in Belgium when it came across a lightly armed convoy of over 100 U.S. troops, mainly members of an artillery observation battalion. After a brief skirmish, the Americans surrendered, expecting customary treatment as POWs. However, Piper was in no mood for encumbrances. His dash towards the Meuse River was already behind schedule, and he feared the interference of prisoners might imperil the mission. After disarming the captured Americans, Piper's men abruptly opened fire with machine guns, killing dozens in the initial volley. Those not slain outright were ruthlessly hunted down and shot individually at close range. Bodies were left strewn across the field and sidewalk, Americans trying to seek refuge in a nearby cafe were killed after Piper's men set the building alight. In total, at least 84 U.S. prisoners were murdered in cold blood at Bognes Crossroads in what became known as the Malmedy Massacre. News of the horrific massacre spread rapidly up the command chain on both sides. For the Americans, it was a war crime that called for harsh justice. But for Piper, 
It was merely an expedient solution to a logistical problem, with little thought given to the humanitarian consequences. In his single-minded focus on accomplishing the mission, Piper had ordered an unambiguous war crime in contravention of the Geneva Convention and any shred of human decency. Malmody would thereafter be indelibly linked with Piper's name as the most notorious atrocity against American troops in Europe. However, Piper also failed in his wider objective at the Bulge. His spearhead became overextended and was eventually halted and surrounded. But the lasting notoriety of Malmedy etched his name among the most brutal and criminal commanders produced by Hitler's Waffen-SS killing machine. There could be no forgiveness or rehabilitation for the perpetrator of such a grievous crime. Trial and Imprisonment in the wake of Germany's total defeat in May 1945, Joachim Piper attempted to go into hiding as one of the most wanted SS fugitives. However, in May he was apprehended by American forces who were actively searching for notorious war criminals. Piper was identified by a former defector from his unit and taken into custody. His transition from SS commander to war crimes defendant was swift. By August 1945, Piper was a key target for interrogation about SS activities during the war. When questioned about his attitudes, Piper chillingly lamented the presence of Jewish survivors and slammed the Americans for not recruiting the Waffen-SS to fight the Soviets. His ongoing radical Nazi views seemed unchanged despite Germany's catastrophic loss. However, Piper was careful to distance himself from any knowledge of concentration camp atrocities, claiming the Waffen-SS was a purely military force. He denied any direct involvement in war crimes apart from strictly obeying orders as an obedient SS officer. But documents and accounts related to killings ordered by Piper proved otherwise. On May 16, 1946, Piper stood trial along with 73 other Waffen-SS personnel accused of war crimes related to the Malmedy massacre and other murders of American troops and Belgian civilians during the Battle of the Bulge. Prosecutors documented Piper's command over his Kampfgruppe and its involvement in mass shootings of U.S. prisoners and unarmed civilians. Faced with extensive testimony from massacre survivors, Piper maintained his professed ignorance. However, the tribunal found most defendants including Piper guilty and sentenced 46 to death by hanging, with 23 given life imprisonment and shorter sentences for the rest. Piper seemed destined to meet his end at the gallows like so many Nazi war criminals before him. However, controversy arose when the SS defendants claimed their confessions had been extracted by torture at the hands of American interrogators. Critics argued the dubious confessions and hangings would just be victor's justice. Calls mounted to exonerate or commute the death sentences pending investigation into torture allegations. In 1948, an official commission concluded that abuses had occurred at the detention center holding the SS men. While findings were inconclusive on the exact effect of interrogation methods, the tribunal responded by commuting many death sentences, including Piper's, to life in prison. Prosecutors felt doubt had been cast on the integrity of the convictions, forever tainting the justice meted out at Dachau. Over the following years, sentiment for releasing the Malmedy convicts grew. Cold War anti-communism and unease over the trial's legitimacy prevailed over outrage. Under review in 1954, Piper's sentence was reduced again to 35 years. Finally, in December 1956, with his release backed by powerful figures, Piper walked free after only 11 years, a far cry from the death sentence passed. For many, justice had been cheated. Post-war life. After his shock release from prison in 1956, Joachim Piper receded from public attention for over a decade. He obtained work with Porsche in automobile sales, but was forced to resign in 1960 due to protests over his controversial past. Piper found a new job as an independent sales promoter, first for a Volkswagen dealer in Reutlingen, and later in the same capacity in Offenburg and Freiburg. He also did some sales promotion work for a carpentry firm in Offenburg. By April 1967, Piper was back in Stuttgart and also got married and started a family. However, post-war Germany was too familiar and too hostile for the notorious ex-SS officer to live unnoticed. So in 1962, Piper and his wife relocated to the village of Travis in eastern France. Seeking anonymity, Piper settled into a quiet civilian life focused on translating military books from English to German. His presence was known to local authorities but went largely unnoticed for several years. Piper seemingly wanted to leave his notoriety behind and blend into obscurity. 
However, in 1976, his wartime identity was publicly exposed through leaflets distributed in Trav's. Given France's own suffering under Nazi occupation, the revelation of Piper's SS role in war crimes generated immense anger and condemnation. French communists and resistance groups were especially outraged over his presence. Nonetheless, Piper was defiant in interviews, denying personal responsibility for war crimes and downplaying his radical politics. He absurdly claimed he was simply a soldier who knew nothing of Nazi atrocities. Piper's incendiary comments served only to spur greater protest at his audacity to live freely in France. His past had finally caught up no matter how much he tried disavowing it. Death threats soon followed, with Piper's dog poisoned in one ominous warning. He turned his home into a veritable fortress, yet refused offers of protection from the French police and German embassy, insisting the threats were just harassment. However, with passions inflamed against him, the stirring of past demons seemed inevitable. Fate of the Piper In the early hours of July 14, 1976, Bastille Day, a group of unknown assailants surrounded and attacked Piper's residence in Traves. Incendiary devices were hurled through ground floor windows, swiftly igniting the interior. Within minutes, the house was engulfed in ravenous flames. Attempts by the panicking Piper to fight the fire proved hopeless. Though he emptied his pistol blindly from upstairs, the inferno below had already cut off all escape routes. As the smoke and flames closed in upstairs, Piper made a desperate attempt to climb out a window onto a ledge. However, overcome by heat and fumes, his grip failed and he plunged to his death. When authorities sifted through the smoldering ruins, they found Piper's charred remains shriveled almost beyond recognition, a gruesome fate for the once prominent SS commander. The attackers had clearly sought not just to destroy Piper's home, but to sentence him to death by fire within it. His dogs were also found shot but alive. In the aftermath, a radical left-wing group claimed responsibility in a letter to newspapers, signing off with a promise to strike more Nazi killers. However, French police never conclusively identified the perpetrators or motive. The shocking murder of the notorious SS officer generated an outpouring of international media interest. Reactions to Piper's death were deeply polarized. Sympathizers saw him as a sacrificial lamb, unfairly made to atone for the sins of World War II and the SS. Critics called it a long overdue sentence for a man who evaded true justice. Those seeking to bury the past saw his killing as a dangerous form of vigilantism. Others deemed it righteous vengeance. The debate also continues over whether Piper deserved his demise for unforgivable war crimes, or if he had paid his dues and should have been left to live out his years in obscurity. In death as in life, Piper remains an enigmatic and divisive figure, but the flames that consumed his modest home in Travis stand as a dramatic final chapter to a lifetime inexorably intertwined with the darkest ideological extremes of the 20th century. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.